Harass my niece, scam me, I'll ruin you completely. This was about nine years ago. I, F48, have an extremely beautiful niece, Emma, F35, on my husband's side. She is a head turner, very approachable, humble, and very smart. She is also very shy and has trouble asserting herself and enforcing boundaries. I used to know a guy, Dean, now 51, from my first marketing job. We worked in the same building. Most youngsters knew each other and grouped for lunch at the lobby cafe. He was a very cool guy, super funny, amenable, and likable. He was clear in his goal of becoming a business owner. Our small group kind of disbanded. I moved on and slowly lost touch with my clique. Fast forward, and now I'm married and actively looking to expand our business. I bumped into Dean at a dentist's appointment. We exchanged updates while in the waiting room. He now owned a small business services company. I looked into his website and decided to give his services a try. He became our regular supplier and our working relationship brought him lots of referrals. Basically, we indirectly helped him build his business. I had my niece Emma apply for a job at his company as he was actively looking for new workers. She was hired as a little bit of everything employee. The pay wasn't great, but she was only one course short of graduating and wanted to build her resume. For about a year, our work routine involved paying him good steady money for extremely professionally done services, payroll, accounting, expo representation, etc. Dean introduced us to Charlie. He'd been complaining that his business was getting slower and slower. 2011, the recent recession was hard to climb out for many small business owners. Charlie was some sort of a consultant. I use the term some sort because his actual scope wasn't clear. Charlie seemed like an okay guy, very formal and polite, with just the right balance between seriousness and smiles. We were invited to a business meeting so that Dean could discuss some stuff and hear our input. This wasn't rare. Dean and I had been avid brainstormers partners and our sessions helped each other back when we first met. We had periodical discussions after we reconnected. I wouldn't discuss my business with him for ethical reasons, but didn't mind hearing him out and perhaps offering my opinion. Charlie and Dean presented a business opportunity, but my husband and I passed. At the end of dinner, everyone pitched in, but the tab was $90 short. Charlie apologized for not having money on him and directly asked my husband to cover him. We covered his portion because we felt we were put on the spot. I made up my mind that if the guy didn't pay us back, I would have Dean reimburse the expense. My husband and I left the restaurant and discussed the dinner surprise. We decided to drop it to avoid getting paranoid. We didn't really know this guy, and Dean didn't seem bothered at all. Charlie paid us immediately, like at 10 o'clock next morning. He was contrite and apologetic. Charlie became a fixture at Dean's office. Dean had a change in behavior. He seemed hungry and thirsty for fast money schemes and quick success. They spent the day on meetings about mostly every MLM on the book. With Dean constantly out of his office, the quality of services dropped significantly. We had to chase him to deliver things on time. We needed to stress the importance of timelines, etc. Dean's office became some sort of a meeting place for the corner cutters, the alpha male wannabes, and the I'm gonna succeed fast and rub it on the face of each person who has called me incompetent, hungry. Our frequent dinner meetings thinned out. Charlie's true character began to surface. Sexist jokes, women are stupid, blah, blah, ethnic jokes, talking down at people, raising his voice. He took a sip off my niece's Coke and she was disgusted. So she gave it to him and got a new one. My niece became Dean's formal assistant. So she had to attend every meeting, sometimes until very late hours. I began to wonder if she was getting paid for the extra hours, but I could be wrong and did not want to interfere. We declined every invitation if we knew Charlie would be there. We signed up for only three yearly services and canceled on other services where customer service had declined. It worked out. Then we paid Dean 10 grand for installing our new platform with control over our own use of technology. Three weeks and we still couldn't use the platform. It didn't support multiple users as needed and we required someone from Dean's company to visit on a daily basis because we couldn't get it running. We simply asked for our money back. Dean agreed and paid us 2,000 and promised the other 8,000 in installments. I asked for a personal meeting because I needed the whole thing solved. We had paid our money, had no service and still had to wait to get my full refund. Really? By then, Charlie had taken full control and was running the show. 
crucial employees randomly got fired. Charlie yelled at everyone and made decisions with Dean never saying a word. My niece looked unhappy. Dean had her carry his suitcase and had her constantly serve Charlie some coffee. I did not appreciate the crude jokes he directed at her either. Dean did nothing, but I stood up for her. Charlie didn't like being challenged, so the atmosphere got really tense. Too many things didn't add up. Charlie painted himself quite the 007 type. He was a former college professor, former business owner, and former marketing director. He spent months away from home and dramatically described one fateful New Year's Eve he spent alone on a plane because he was extremely necessary for the company, so he became a workaholic, as the final straw that caused the end of his marriage. He was a fast talker, good with numbers and knowledgeable. He claimed long motorcycle rides in exotic places such as Italy, yet he had no car, was living at a friend's house, and showed limited proficiency. I pressed for my money, and Charlie went ballistic. He tried to put me in a corner and tried to intimidate me. He asked, are you a software expert? Are you? Because if you were, you wouldn't need our services? Answer my question, or shut up and stop talking because you don't know what you are doing. I answered, I wasn't an expert. He replied to, then close you f mouth. I got up and told him I'm no expert, but I'm the paying client. I warned him to watch his mouth and that he would not get a second warning. My relationship with Dean was strained. He did not stand up for me, not as a friend, but as a client. I told Dean I would never again deal with Charlie on no uncertain terms. I cancelled all accounting and payroll services immediately. Zero trust. I researched Charlie's background. None of his corporate experience checked out. He had an extensive criminal record. Gender violence, bank and wire fraud, securities fraud, patrimonial crimes, and a pending arrest warrant dated eight years prior. I forwarded this to Dean. He never replied. I urged my niece to leave her job, but she decided to end her semester and then get another job. Bad decision. She said Dean owed her overtime and leaving her job would almost guarantee she would never see that money. Dear contacted me with a solution. He gave me an unconvincing apology and asked me to meet him and an excellent software company owner who could help. I insisted on getting my refund, but he promised he would cover the expense. I addressed Charlie's criminal records, and he said he didn't know, but had confronted Charlie and had cut ties for good, lying. Charlie claimed all had been solved and he was now on probation. I met the lady. Her name was Frances and she was hostile, standoffish and showed a superiority complex. She owned a yacht, multiple real estates, and had a presence across several states. I left when the meeting was over without an actual resolution. She hardly mentioned anything about software. Frances talked a big game on other topics. I researched her and found lots of questionable information. I asked Dean directly if she was in any way connected to Charlie. He offered a vague answer, I don't know, it could be. When I pressed for a yes or no, he said, I can't compromise the integrity of my success by indulging in your unfounded assumptions. His business was drying up. He saw Francis as his savior. She engaged him to help her set up one of her big companies and would pay him 750,000 total. She would also pay him two grand a week for six months just to do some company creation work. I had a software engineer install a new system. Our initial intention was to get Dean's software up and running to avoid the additional cost of a new installation. The engineer informed me that the software could not possibly run because it was a knockoff from an outdated system. He advised me to file a complaint for fraud. I didn't want to get my niece involved. I just wanted her out of that place. By then, Dean was actively trying to insert himself in his clients' businesses. He made stupid decisions based on getting an undetermined percent of what we achieve. Companies shied away from him and his snake oil tactics. Some more research led me to the conclusion that Dean had inflated his company's capacity for specialty software. So he also inflated the price, took $2,000 for himself, and gave Charlie $8,000 to get whatever garbage they could sell me. This is exactly why I could not get my 8,000 back. Francis was their source of software. I notified Dean that due to the nature of his relationship with a felon, we were canceling all remaining services. My niece got fired that afternoon, and Dean's excuse was her refusal to give Charlie a ride. Emma came to me and my husband. She was scared and very emotional. She explained that when I gave Dean my canceling notice, she was in his car and was about to get off and enter the office. 
Dean slammed the door so hard, the car shook. She was so perplexed, it took her a few seconds to get out. So Dean opened the door, yelled, "Fucking move. The situation with Charlie had also escalated. Emma addressed this at work, but Dean's response was, grow up, toughen up. How do you expect to make it in this cutthroat world if you're gonna be so sensitive? Charlie's jokes became overtly sexual and explicit. There was one incident months earlier. Charlie was drunk after yet another failed business meeting. Dean ordered Emma to drive Charlie home. He tried to sexually assault her during the ride. He claimed he couldn't remember, therefore it never happened. This time, she refused to be Charlie's driver and potential rape victim. Dean fired her after ranting about how Charlie was being targeted by losers and faithless no, it alls. He got into a power trip and became verbally abusive, calling her a Miss Goody Two Shoes, and reminding her that she had been able to eat the whole time she worked for him, because he paid her out of pity. He emailed her that due to her insubordination, lack of honesty, and malicious manipulation, her duties were terminated, effective immediately. My husband and I supported her. We paid a good lawyer. This was no longer just about money. I went straight to the restaurant where Dean and Charlie routinely held their meetings. I confronted Dean in front of his clients and warned Charlie that his luck had ended. Next time I see him, he would need suck his own D underscore 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 underscore. I became very attentive to detail. I researched all types of records and found that Charlie had jumped probation and the arrest warrant was still in effect. The legal system had failed miserably at finding him. He had felonies in multiple states and the supposed time doing business overseas was actually jail time. Emma proved her case on sexual harassment and Dean had to pay 15,000 in owed salary and punitive damages and had to pay some fines. I contacted as many of his former fired employees as possible via Facebook and encouraged them to sue him. Three of them actually did. One of them won. I wanted him under legal and financial strain. He was ordered to refund my money plus legal costs. The judge didn't accept his but it's Charlie's fault excuse. My contract was directly with Dean, not Charlie. He also had to pay me for breach of confidentiality because Charlie wasn't his employee nor a legally bound business partner. The court opened a new investigation over potential financial fraud and theft of information, identity, etc. As Dean had access to clients' accounting and payroll information with lots of data. A new order of apprehension was issued against Charlie, but he ran. The judge ordered Dean's business permanently closed. A forfeiture notice was issued. I saw, on his FB business page, an announcement that Dean had been invited as a guest lecturer in a nearby college. Funny, because Dean never actually finished college, and I knew this from the beginning. I contacted them and voiced my concern over an unqualified professor teaching at their institution. I leaked his lack of academic standing by trolling their propaganda. They ended up announcing a different professor for the course without further explanation. During that fall, a former coworker called my niece to give her the news that Francis had been arrested by the feds for a fraud scheme, not related to my revenge, but still sweet. The best part is that she stopped paying the 2000 a week early on, but kept stringing him along for free work. I sent a formal notice to all the companies I had referred him to and explained that I could no longer recommend his services. I added a copy of our own lawsuit Companies were dropping like flies. Other lawsuits strung along for dishonest services. This set a chain of events that lead to his downfall. He had some car repo situations back when the business began to fail. I called the company and told them where to find him and at what time. That was easy, because although by now he had closed shop, he and Charlie kept eating at the same restaurant. I wasn't there to see it, but confirmed the car was towed. His marriage broke apart. He faced charges for selling and profiting from illegal software. He got probation. He lost his home and illegally occupied a portion of the abandoned commercial building next to his former location. I leaked this info in an anti-gentrification regional FB group. The zone was under scrutiny because residents were being pushed away. He used the spot as a small office and living quarters. The residents wanted it as a community center. They held a protest right in front. The police came. He was charged with trespassing and stealing electricity from a nearby building. Goodbye probation. Charlie was harder to nail. He disappeared for years. I could not find him. Again, he later gained confidence. His social media became moderately active. He claimed to own some bogus business. He never appeared in any of his pictures posts. 
I pondered whether he was posting from inside of jail or something. I went to his aunt's profile. She posted regularly. Some pictures showed him doing family gathering stuff. I found out via her comments that he now had a young child and his legs were amputated from too much drinking poor control over his blood sugar. Same bad person, freaking liar. Picture caption, happy birthday, dear son, even though cold hearted people are keeping us apart. I found out he had an unpaid child support case. I anonymously contacted both the baby mama and the child support division. I gave them everything, his aunt's address and every freaking place I knew he visited. He was arrested and new charges were filed, including sexual battery, I don't know about this one, and financial abuse of a mentally ill adult. I only recovered 3,000 out of the 8,000 he took. My case against him lasted almost two years, but seeing him all pale and listening to his trembling voice during the court hearings was more than enough. The case took a toll on his already weakened health. His hands trembled. He cried and got ill when he was sentenced. He just kind of dropped his head and became super pale. Then he motioned his head to each side and shivered as he got help from the medics. I remember the judge's opening sentence was, I'm tired of this case. In over 10 years, I've read your name in multiple warrants and yet you avoid responsibility, forcing us to spend taxpayer money on tracking you. What's wrong with you? You plead and bring up your health problems, but none of that deterred you from stealing, abusing and debilitating the integrity of those under your influence. I smiled at his face as many times as I could when the judge wasn't looking. He served four years out of a 36 year sentence and died in 2019.